Hello and welcome to Linux Lads, episode 115. As usual, I'm joined by Connor, Mike. Hello, hello. Hello. And special guest, Jake, our editor. Say hello, Jake. Hello. Uh, so Amelis not here. He's actually uh, attending an event in uh, Washington, D.C., I believe. So yeah, Jake is going to step in because we've been meaning to get him on for the longest time because he's he edits the podcast now f- instead of me for quite quite some time now. It just seems only fair to get him on at least once. So before we talk to Jake, though, we're going to go straight to our news because um, we've got quite a few things to talk about there. Um, Amalith put in a few links that he wants us to let you know about while he's uh, gone. Uh, the first one is Chris Walden of uh, Geo fame. So that's like the GUI interface for um, or library for Go. Um, him and Mike are both a fan, but he is organizing a, a Wattwise game jam. Uh, that's at Wattwise, W-A-T-T-W-I-S-E dot games. And uh, check that out if if you're uh, if you're interested in joining. That's an interesting thing. So basically, make games, but make them so that they consume uh, as little energy per second as possible, which is an interesting concept because you know if you if you run a game today, especially a AAA title, you know that you need a, a beefy graphical you know graphics card, and that those things obviously take a lot of power. So trying to do it the other way. It's um, it might be an interesting challenge for people. Uh, one thing that I'm just reading down through it, and they said, um, so what's accepted is like uh, either include any runtime dependencies or rely solely on open source ones. Example, uh, web browsers such as Chrome, Chromium, Firefox, uh, console emulators uh, for real consoles, which I found is interesting. So uh, the give, examples to give is uh, PC SX2, the PlayStation 2 emulator, Dolphin for um, Wii or GameCube, um, Game Boy Advance, uh, etc., and uh, some fantasy and virtu- virtual virtual uh, machines as well. So um, yeah, uh, they they seem to accept a wide variety. I just f- found it very interesting that, that you could write games um, for a a console emulator, despite the fact that that console, needless to say, never ran that game in the first place. So just found that it, it was interesting when I was reading it. We should also probably mention that uh, the submission period, I guess, is between March 22nd, 2024 and April 22nd, 2024. So it lasts for about a month. Okay, so yeah, certainly check that out if you're interested. Um, uh, next thing we'll move on to. So there's been some backlash against uh, the Kagi Brave partnership. Um, I read about this very briefly, but uh, if anyone wants to know, wants to uh, give us a rundown of this situation, go ahead. Kagi is a... Uh, uh... I think paid uh, search engine that uh, that have got gotten semi-famous in our circles because it provided some decent results and it was a nice story up until uh, they included the Brave search API. So you know, I think Kagi uses several different searches to make the search out of. They eventually included the Brave API, which people don't like because there are two major things to dislike about Brave. One is the cryptocurrency involvement uh, that they do. That is a, a hard nope for a lot of people. And the other one is the in, is that Brave is uh, led by a guy who's previously been... It's Look it up, Brandon Ike. Uh, I don't remember exactly the case, but either he was against uh, legalization of gay marriage in California or he was for its delegalization. I don't remember exactly. I can I can clarify that. So uh, he's uh, he's known for his uh, financial support of California's Proposition 8, a.k.a. California's gay marriage ban. Yeah, so a lot of people are, are take issue with the fact that Brave would wor- work with a company le- led by someone uh, with those views. Also, my understanding of it is that he, he was he was heavily involved in Mozilla, um, quite senior, and then didn't they like let him go or heavily suggest that he could leave, and then he formed Brave. Yeah, he was he was there. He was a CEO of Mozilla, I believe, for about a fortnight, and people protested against exactly that, against his involvement with what Shane said, the proposition. Mm. And then, so that's a bit of a history. Uh, that's why Brave gets a lot of um, controversy. Some people are really like for it and some people are really against it uh i don't know personally uh, i don't use it for these specific reasons because i don't like the people behind it uh and there's vivaldi if i ever need to use a browser that's not firefox vivaldi is great so uh that's one thing but so so kagi is a search to to, to get back to the topic mm-hmm. so kagi uh 
would you say like aggregate searches and gives you gives you the search better? If Amolev was here, he would be able to explain it better because he's actually used it. They they started including the API. I believe there's some transfer of money. I'm not exactly sure, but basically the backlash from the uh, from from everybody is like, why are you getting yourself involved with these people? So uh, I, sh- I should say that uh, Kagi, I don't know if we're pronouncing that right, but it's spelled K-A-G-I. They did respond to this um, and they did say that essentially, I'm going to paraphrase heavily here, but you can look at, look all this up. Uh, we have links in the show notes. But uh, uh, they basically said our goal is to provide the best web results in the world. That means including as many sources of search results as we can get. So essentially, like, I'll just give you the gist, like, they're basically saying we need to do what we need to do to make our product good and successful. Um, And, you know, essentially, like, if some people within those entities that we deal with have some views, it's it's a bitter pill to swallow, but we got to do it, essentially. Um, heavily paraphrasing there so <laughs> like you you read the sources make up your own opinions you know come to your own conclusions maybe it's a good opportunity to very briefly um, give a shout out for alternative search engines or to say which ser- search engine you tend to use i've used DuckDuckDo uh in the past and currently i'm using um start page so um i find the start page is is quite good for my needs but um who knows that might change in the future, but I thought I'd give th- those uh, a shout out. I use Ecosia, but I'm pretty sure that's just Google in the background. It's, so start page, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's just like it's aggregating or, or referring or whatever you want to call it. So, uh, but Ecosia, the, you know, every search you make gives them a kickback so they can then use that to plant trees. So they, they give you a little ticker of how many trees you're planting by searching on Ecosia. I don't know if it's legit, I, I, but the, that's my bag, environmentalism. Yay for the uh, for the Google aggregators. <laughs> I use another one. I host uh, a thing called Hoogle. I can't pronounce my W's, so it's W-H-O-O-G-L-E. That, again, puts itself uh, in front of Google kind of a proxy, and whenever I do search, it will just fetch back, uh, fetch back the results from Google, which is great because Google doesn't give me doesn't take my data it, but and i still get the same shitty results as i would go from google <laughs> but and we might come back to this later i'm actually like heavily using bing gpt or bing chat or copilot or whatever they are calling it this second because uh, I, i'm just getting amazingly better results for most of things i need from a chatbot than i'm get than i get from google I just not say that Bing, the search engine, is any good. That's still shite. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, the uh, the DAI is basically serving my, need, my needs. I also tried briefly Murina Search, uh, which uh, I don't I don't. It's called Spot, I believe. I'm not exactly sure what it runs. That's and that's I, I think is also some kind of a aggregator. But I wasn't. It, it just wasn't working properly. So so yeah, basically, uh, it's Google and Copilot for me. Jake, what what search engine do you use? Yeah, you've been very quiet. You don't have to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty uh, boring, I guess. I just use DuckDuckGo most of the time. If DuckDuckGo fails me, I'll I'll try falling back to Google. But I haven't had any real success with finding something that gives high quality search results for all of my queries. But there is a smaller one that I've heard of and used for trying to find things on smaller websites called Marginalia Search at search.marginalia.nu. They say it's a, an independent DIY search engine that focuses on non-commercial content. And I think it does a, a pretty good job about that. But then, you know, you don't get the stuff that you get from a regular search engine, like, what is it, zero-click results, where you can type in something like weather or a calculation, and it just gives you the results right away. So it's a more classical search engine. Is this CSS, is this using HTML tables? Sorry, I can't help. It me, might be. But... <laughs> I haven't looked at it, but uh, it is all open source, open source with an AGPL license. And there's another one that I used in the past, but haven't used in a while, is uh, Cirx, do you know the S-E-A or oh, X? Yeah. Um, but that relies on instances of it, and you find the instances frequently go down or are not updated, or Google uh, comes against them with like angry lawyers and, and shuts them down or something. Yeah, I, I wonder how fed. I wonder if federated search could ever really be a thing. You just need you just need the people to turn it on. 
and that's the problem it's not this it's not the, it's not the technology it's the people that are the problem i guess as, as as soon as i heard mike saying you just need the people to turn it on immediately in my mind i heard dung 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 <laughs> it's it's skynet all over again <laughs> mike so following on from what we discussed a few weeks ago where you were talking about attitudes to ai and stuff like that um we were talking about how you see on Mastodon, there's a lot of hate directed towards AI in our circles. And I'm feeling this way myself as well. I'm starting to kind of see the usefulness of some models um, and, and some tools that are based on AI. So uh, you you put something in the show notes here. You're like, AI has been super helpful to me and you're sick of the vitriol. So you, you go. <laughs> go. <laughs> I know from my own experience that it's super helpful because uh, I'm still... St- studying and the amount of time I just need some information and it's literally easier to ask a chatbot and get it from it than trying to Google. Uh, that's just for me that's just number one. I want to know something about something. I just go to I just go into the copilot uh, thing and it works out only for, obviously for things that I know something about so that I don't get you know when it when it does make shit up and it does it obviously then I need to know. So yeah, for things that I'm uh, that I know something about, I find better results from this. Plus, I use uh, the GitHub Copilot for things as well. Now I'm following a course that I might be take, talking about later uh, separately, and I'm uh, I'm getting great results with GitHub Copilot there. And I've that's so that's the plus part. Like this has been a really good experience for me. It adds it edit. It's an addition of things, and. Then I've seen, you know, constantly people, specifically on Mustard, and just coming up with bringing up bad points of AI, which obviously makes sense because there are many bad points. But people started use as people are starting utilizing this technology more and more. There is now shit being thrown at these people, which is not cool. Like I have an example. I'm not gonna put the, like a link or anything because I blocked the whole discussion. And I probably wouldn't find it now without deblocking some people. But uh, there was a there was a guy who makes an open source app that that is fantastic. I use it myself, and he came up with new icons, and the icons were AI generated. And he gave he got crap for this. I'm not gonna say who it was because I didn't talk to him about talking uh, talking about this. So let's just let's just leave it at that. But basically, people are saying you are ripping off real artists because uh, because you are using AI. And I'm thinking, okay, so he does something for free, so he wouldn't be paying anybody anyway for this. I, I'd imagine because the thing probably doesn't make money. So he probably wouldn't go and drop a thousand euro or how much it would take for a real artist to to create icons. And second, like you want to do something cool in a sense, certain direction. You want to write code because you enjoy writing code, but you also need some assets, right? You might need gra- graphics, you might need this and that. Well, the moment you start chasing after artists and people who make sound and maybe you want translation, so you, you get people, you get people who speak different languages. And so you are basically from, in, instead of a coder, you are now a project manager. And that's not what everybody wants to do in their spare time. Like, and and lastly, more most importantly, like if you if you don't like that people are using AI, then by all means stop using the project or talk to them about it, but in a civil manner. Like don't be don't be an asshole about it. And that I think that boundary of civility has been broken. And it annoys me double because it hasn't really been broken until people figure out that AI is stealing art. Which it is, and it should be prevented, maybe. Maybe not, that's a different conversation. If I were to go on a tangent, I'd say that intellectual property is bullshit anyway, and the only reason why I actually honor it and why uh, is because it's illegal not to. And But like people are saying, well, artists are going to starve because AI is stealing their work. And that's an idiotic argument. We need to change the society so that people don't fucking starve. And not change, you know, not, we don't need to stop technological progress because somebody is going to lose the crappy job that made them just above poverty line. No, we need to stay, people should be able to eat regardless of what they do or if they don't do anything, right? 
but no, we are going to perpetuate. Uh, and I'm just getting angry. So somebody stop me by all means. <laughs> but but what what people are doing now with a massive amount of vitriol, arguing against the technology that has been proven helpful, whilst perpetuating uh, late stage capitalism, where either you know if you if you do what uh, some people want and you don't change the copyright law, then obviously people will, uh, then obviously the people who are getting rich from the copyright law will still get, keep getting richer, and the artists will just mostly uh, still be able to scrounge some living, because I assume artists are not exactly rich these days. If you change the copyright law the way OpenAI would like you to change, then obviously OpenAI, a bunch of rich guys, are going to get richer. So why don't we throw this whole thing away? and start from the point where we are actually looking after people, regardless of them having a job or not, or doing anything productive or not. And then maybe it doesn't matter that that AI uses someone's intellectual property because, and that's the last thing I say, intellectual property is bullshit because nothing exists in a vacuum. vacuum and you as a human being have ne- has never had an idea that's not been inspired by people around you. So what you're going to do when you sell your idea, you're going to give everybody around you a dollar. I don't think so. I do uh, I do definitely get what you're saying. Yes. Uh, it's it's but I think it's a hell of a hell of a, a high level argument and and a very kind of like broad argument I suppose, but I definitely agree with you. It's like uh, I I would see it in a more practical way. I would see it like it, what brought, what kind of won me around to, to certain AI tools was that like what you said, it's like if you want to create something, it just takes the pain out of all the peripheral work that you need to do around the project that, you know, you might know how to do very well. So someone creating artwork for something, uh, which I've seen myself and thought about doing myself because I'm, I enjoy science fiction. I want to write science fiction and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's a kind of a background hobby of mine. And it's like, if I want to create artwork for that, I, I can't draw for shit like so I, I need to get like stable diffusion or mid journey or something to make that shit for me um and it will look really cool probably you know if i if i work on it hard enough but what 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 really changed it for me was like it's it's not it's not that like ai is going to replace anyone i don't think that will happen i think it will replace certain like menial tasks for sure like computers did at one point and computer program that's the point of a computer computer program to take care of the smaller harder details that that you don't know how to do or are very hard to do and get straight to what you want to do and what you want to produce so that that's the way i see it you know like you know don't don't just rage against it because it's it doesn't fit in with your notion of how work should be done or how effort should be expended just like get on board with it it's happening it's going to happen it's here to stay like so let's just start trying to figure out a way to use it and effectively and ethically and you know just because i like there's a lot of technologies that come along where you're just like okay this will probably blow over in a year or two and you know you're sometimes right you know like vr 3d movies things like that you know flashy things gimmicky things but like ai is that kind of thing i think this is a fairly fundamental shift and we're in the early days of it and we have we don't know shit like we don't know how this is going to pan out like how this is going to change how we work we haven't a clue like i i i've i've looked into this quite a bit and uh i've seen a few youtube videos from developers and stuff and and there's a lot of people saying like development is going to look completely different in 5 to 10 years uh but there won't be nobody developing people will still have to know how to maintain these things and create these models and know how to use these models in the right way and know how to use the models to augment their own creativity and their own intelligence like you have to know how to use it effectively um and yeah, the ethical thing, I think, is something we need to look at and we need, definitely need to have in mind all the time, but as we should with anything we do. But yeah, I'm, it's, it's just a lead, follow, or get out of the way, basically. <laughs> so in, in summary, both of you are look, really looking forward to the co-pilot key that Microsoft is introducing on, on the keyboard of, of, of computers. <laughs> No, I am not. <laughs> I, I think say. that's going to be about as useful as Siri or, um, you know, uh, so not much, or Bixby. Oh, fuck. That's Bigsby. what it comes down to, though, isn't it? It's the marketing bullshit. It's the, it's, the, it's the greedy motherfuckers getting their little greasy claws into it 
and making it into a product and stamping it and, you know, keeping it all for themselves and trying to create a closed ecosystem and you can only use our thing and you have to pay us money, you know, like that's what people don't like really at the end of the day is the greed. Um, but the technology itself, like, I don't think that's the real issue. It usually isn't. I, uh, I mean, okay, there is some technology that's definitely doesn't, that exists maybe because of the greed, uh, you know, and just, just, just as a byproduct that would have been invented, maybe lasted a few years and then just gone away and never gone away because people are using it as an expression of their greed. But this one, I think is here to stay. And, uh, we, we need to just, you know, it's, it's, um, people were worried about what's going to happen to painters where cam- when cameras started being a thing. Well, what happened is, uh, entirely new art form came up uh you know you have you had painting and now you have painting and photography which uh, you know that's um, that's an addition yeah that's a great example yeah i mean a lot of people were raging against photography and they said it's going to destroy the yeah exactly what you said it's going to destroy the whole discipline of painting jake you're awfully quiet there yes i uh, i haven't used many AI, I haven't used any AI tools. I did briefly when um, Chatty Jeeps or Chat Chippity or however you want to say it, uh, when that came out, a friend and I played around with like seeing what it could do. We weren't very impressed at, at what it came up with. Um, it, it tended to just start coming up with nonsense or eventually ignoring what we were telling it or just repeating itself over and over. But I suppose it has, there, there have been some improvements since then. And I have seen people using things like stable diffusion, for example, to uh, either do very simple things like just create thumbnails for their YouTube videos, or more complicated things like providing a baseline for artistic work. So they don't just take what the AI gives it, but they build upon it. So they use it as a, as a baseline or as a uh, place of inspiration or something like that. And then they make their own work on top of it. The technology has issues, for sure. Uh, just say like, yes, there are the intellectual property issues, there are the environmental impact issues, because it takes a huge amount of electricity to train the models and even to use the models. But I mean, eh, with any kind of topic like this, there are going to be people who are hardcore on one side and hardcore on the other side. And I don't think that helps anybody. Like any extremist reaction to it is just usually not anything worth interacting with, because you need some level of moderation if you want to actually make I don't know, some kind of progress in, in your discussion or reach a conclusion that actually makes sense. I can see how a lot of people are very angry at how much easier it's become to just create total garbage using AI, where you can just, you know, blast out useless, you know, filler garbage YouTube videos or articles or whatever onto the web more easily than you've ever done before. I definitely understand why that makes people upset, and it should. But on the other hand, it's also something that is a useful tool to people who are making things. And I don't think that the people who are using it as a tool responsibly should be subject to the vitriol, the same vitriol, the same kind of attitude that the people who are just creating garbage are exposed to. Yeah, ultimately, I think yelling at each other is not going to help anybody. And you're you're just going to be stuck on the internet yelling at each other while everybody else who is trying to do something with the technology is just going to move on past you and just ignore what you have to say because you're not you're not actually joining in any discussion you're just yelling at people yeah you really hit the nail on the head there for me when you said that uh people use it as like uh, and i completely agree with everything you said like absolutely 100 percent. it's like but you said like people use it as a baseline for their art and they don't just take the output that it gives them and just sell that like some people do that but they're usually people who are just trying to make quick money because what you see is a lot of ai generated videos on youtubes youtubes <laughs> you get a uh, you get a lot of ai generated videos where the voice the visuals everything is is just ai generated yeah and uh, probably even the subject of the video and the title and the thumbnail and everything it's just like people just run models on a powerful computer boom just spit out a video po- post like several of them a day about some bullshitty science subject like or something elon musk said or some shit i don't know and uh and then just they just put that on youtube and they just spam youtube basically across like dozens of channels with phony sciencey names and thumbnails of galaxies and stuff so you think it's legit and it's like 
it's garbage. It's absolute garbage. But the people who are using it in a responsible, good way can really like speed up what they do by a, a huge factor and, and, and by not by actually hurting anyone, really. I've, I've heard examples of 100% AI generated OnlyFans. <laughs> yes. No, I actually, I was, I was, I had a great chat with my, with my partner about this the other day. Uh, I showed her that the, there's a name for this uh, OnlyFans star that's completely AI, AI generated. And it's like this very realistic kind of slightly Mediterranean looking woman with pink hair. Uh, who's obviously like super attractive and like like very athletic and stuff and it's just like it's clear that someone tuned this model but but what's very interesting is that on the close-ups and stuff you can see blemishes on her face and you can see pores and stuff so they've actually fine-tuned this model to such a degree that you have this obviously very attractive woman that people want to subscribe to an OnlyFans to see naked pictures of or whatever but like they, they introduce just enough imperfection to, to kind of make you think it's kind of a real person. And some of the photos are actually incredibly like, like you would think it's a real person, like in some of the photos. Obviously, there's others where like you can see like it looks just something looks a little bit off, you know, like, <laughs> you know, you can kind of tell it's a bit too perfect. And so, yeah, that's kind of a scary future. And this is only like the very beginnings of this as well. So what the hell is all this going to look like in a few years? So, yeah, I can see why people are sounding the alarm bells on this. If it's misused, it can be used to do great harm and great evil. But uh, it, it all depends on how you use it. I mean, you can use a knife to cut vegetables or you can use it to stab someone. <laughs> just to reduce it right down to the basics <laughs> deep man deep <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it's it's true like it's absolute it sounds simplistic but it's absolutely true like you know anything can be used for evil and to think uh like was it a year or two ago people were concerned about deep fakes <laughs> oh we're way past that <laughs> <laughs> It's not just superimposing someone's face on another person's body anymore. It's like you can literally just type a prompt and there are there are applications out there that will just do this for you. They will say, show me a video of someone with this face doing this and it'll give you a video. Anyway, to, to get away from all the very deep philosophical discussion, as much as I enjoyed it, I think maybe we'll go straight to talking to Jake. <laughs> So, so Jake, how did you, what got you into Linux then? I don't actually remember the first thing that made me try it. It was probably a friend in high school. I remember the first distribution I tried was Ubuntu because at the time Ubuntu was the only like remotely user friendly desktop distribution. So I just kind of, at the time, I kept switching back and forth between it. I, I would install it. I would play around with something on it, and then I would reboot back into Windows to play video games. I'm sure this story sounds very familiar to a lot of people, because mm -hmm. almost everybody that I know has gotten into Linux the same way. And then in university, I started to use it a lot more, because I was doing a computer science degree, and of course, I tried, I think for the first, the first year or so, because we were doing Python and Java mostly, uh, using Windows was kind of fine, because you could just install the Python interpreter, install something like Sublime Text, or install the IntelliJ IDE for Java, and you could just do stuff on Windows without any issue. But come the later years when we were starting to program in things like C and C++ and whatnot, being in a Linux environment or a Unix-like environment was a lot better, much better experience. That was also the time I learned Vim and whatnot. Uh, what are you currently running, and how do you find it? So... Uh, yeah, after a long journey mm -hmm. of going from Ubuntu to Linux Mint and Ubuntu Mate, like Ubuntu Flavors, going through Arch Linux and Gen 2 and Alpine and Artix and all these, I've, I've run several Linux distributions, usually for a period of months or maybe a year or so. I have landed on elementary OS. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I, I think, I don't know, but basically what happened was I, I got really into Linux, and then I got really sick of Linux. <laughs> and, then, and I just wanted a system that would just let me get on with my work and not get in my way all the time, which is a lot of the issues that I had with something like uh, Arch, that, you know, 
I would do a system update and then that would break something with Python. And then I would be using Qt browser at the time. So I wouldn't be able to use my web browser. And I was just like, I'm done with all that. Just give me a nice looking stable Linux operating system that I can easily play games on and also easily do whatever else I need to get done without having to fiddle with the system too much. Like I'll leave my experimentation to the times I want to experiment and not the times I need my computer to work. So that's why I've, mm -hmm. I've ended up on elementary. Yeah. How is the gaming on that? Because I believe elementary is kind of always uh, holding to the Ubuntu LTS with trying to, you know, get things really, really working properly before they do any kind of major updates. So it's not too old. And for my hardware, which is uh, AMD 5600X and an RX 6800 XT, they're actually perfectly well supported on this distribution. And I haven't had any issues playing games with it. I will also say that elementary has done a pretty good job at prioritizing things like design and accessibility. You know, they might not necessarily have the flashiest marketing, but they do provide a really solid, stable desktop environment that is fairly well integrated and also adds extra accessibility options like display color filters and uh, what do you call it? Like the day night changing between dark mode and light mode, like stuff like that. Little touches here and there that other distributions I find often lack are present on elementary OS. Mm -hmm. When when it's available for uh, for what they call the Apple Silicon, I might give it a try. But uh, that's not, that's I don't think it's there yet. Is Asahi the new Arch? <laughs> no, because uh, uh, I, be, you know. I, I believe Nix OS is the new arch. Uh, it's so much so that when we were over at the Ubuntu Summit, um, Martin Wimpress, one, one of the days, was running around with a t shirt saying, By the way, I run Nix OS. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will say it definitely feels like that these days. I have not touched it, and then I kind of honestly don't want to touch it, but uh, <laughs> I hear about it constantly. <laughs> I was the exact same. Uh, I, I started out with Ubuntu and then discovered Linux Mint as an extension of Ubuntu. But the difference is now 10 years later, 10 or 12 years later, I'm, I'm, I'm on Linux Mint again, and I have been for the last year and a half. Well, this is the thing. So the way Jake was describing it, uh, you know, Ubuntu, Mint, uh, Ubuntu Mate, and then it went off the rails, you know, Arch, Gentoo, <laughs> Alpine, out of all things. And I thought, this guy is going to end, end up on Nix, and then you went Elementary OS. There was, a, there was a, some kind of a very hard pivot there which <laughs> yeah i understand that you, you you know you you go to the experimentation after your system and now you just want the shit to work without having to reconfigure everything every day that's why i'm on mint yeah <laughs> a mint zorn os um elementary are are good they're based on ubuntu so they they're like okay uh, ubuntu will get all of the hard stuff out of the way which is like the the hard work testing making sure all the drivers work all of that kind of thing making sure that it's stable and then we will do our refinements on top of it which is a uh, user experience refinements or any, anything like that for people who just want a distro to just work i probably recommend any of those three which is like for, they're kind of very opinionated but based on ubuntu yeah uh, we know that you also sometimes uh play for the other side uh jake you you <laughs> Uh, is there some sexual euphemism that I just said? Maybe. Uh, you, uh, by the which I mean, you use BSD as well. Uh, yeah. What makes you do that to yourself? <laughs> I have to be careful with what I say here, else I'll anger a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> no, we are chilled. So, 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 what you said? You've you've danced with the devil. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. So my first exposure to running a BSD-based operating system was uh, hosting my email server on OpenBSD. So my first time using OpenBSD and my first time hosting an email server, I was just like, okay, let's just, let's just do this. And then, yeah, I got into it. I really like how well the systems are developed and put together on that side. I like how relatively stable they tend to be in terms of their choice of technology and in terms of their day-to-day -day operation. So I just kind of started to run more and more BSD. So now I have almost all of my servers running on BSD. My laptop is running OpenBSD. And uh, I'll, I'll be diplomatic with it like that. That's all I'll say. <laughs> I've, I've, I've not had much exposure to uh, BSD, but uh, because mainly because the um, 
the unique uh, selling points and um, there are ones that genuinely appeal to people um, just don't really motivate me that much. The two of the biggest ones that they say is the native integration with uh, ZFS um, because they don't have any licensing issues in, in that regard. Um, and also, the is it the jails, the containerized? Uh, I, I don't know much about it, but yeah. Yeah. On, on FreeBSD, ZFS is natively supported um, and pretty well integrated into the operating system. Uh, and the same thing with jails on FreeBSD. Yeah, it's uh, essentially, it's it's not quite the same thing as containerization on Linux. It's not really the same mechanism, I guess, but it's a similar concept. And yeah, it's um, I, I actually run a system that uses ZFS and JLS, and it's been very stable. Those are the two big selling points of, of FreeNAS, now it's TrueNAS. Is because it's based on BSD. So they, they both, they have heavily advertise both those features. What? What kind of so you said that you have uh, BSD, Open BSD, or Free BSD? I don't remember on your laptop. Open BSD, yeah. Open BSD. What what kind of desktop environment does that use? Is that something we would know about, or does it have its own thing? Uh, it might be something you know about because there are portable versions. But I'm currently right now running CWM, uh, the Calm Window Manager. It's called by default. It's a floating or stacking window manager, but everybody that I know just uses it with two windows tiled side by side. So yeah. Ah, so basically you're just trying to persuade us, well, I'm just this completely, you know, chilled guy who just basically uses elementary on his machine because I just want shit to work. Whilst you have this other thing, mm-hmm. completely esoteric, <laughs> uh, that probably I would definitely not be able to use. And um, yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty hardcore. Uh, what do you edit this here podcast on? I edit it on Linux because Ardor is not available on OpenBSD. And I did try to get it to compile on OpenBSD, but I would have had to fiddle with their build system and I just lost all motivation <laughs> to do that. Uh, how do you how do you find the audio production workflow on, on Linux? Yeah, I, I would say um, I don't really have any problems with editing audio on Linux. I mean, there's... Okay, so let me start at the beginning, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, I edit the podcast using a mixture of Audacity and Ardor. Audacity mostly for things like uh, the noise removal and the clip fixing. So I try to use Audacity's built-in plugins to fix that as much as possible. Beyond that, I used to use Audacity for editing the entire podcast, but uh, I don't generally enjoy torturing myself like that. So I eventually picked up Ardor and that's been really good. In fact, Ardor was so good that after I finished editing the first episode of the podcast that I edited with Ardor, I just went and donated money to them because I'm like, you need to keep this project going. This is a very good piece of software. You have literally just described my first three years of editing this podcast <laughs> <laughs> but yeah um i just i edit it using audacity and ardor and both of those do run on windows and i did try to experiment with with editing the podcast on windows when i took a break from running linux on my desktop system when i started just using my desktop mostly for gaming but it just didn't feel good i don't know how to describe it but it just felt like i wasn't as effective yeah you're you're saying that uh, you're we're not the only people who feel kind of icky when we're on windows yeah a, a little bit <laughs> and certainly even just something like managing the files like un- unzipping the archive and and putting the files in the right place and just having all of that just didn't feel right but yeah i've had no problems with audio editing on Linux, it's pretty straightforward. The applications are just the application, so it's mostly down to how well those work as opposed to how well the operating system works. So, yeah. One thing I'm curious about, Jake, is uh, like how has the experience been of editing Linux lads for the last y- year and year and a bit? Um, like, do you find it challenging? <laughs> like, this is your chance. <laughs> I, 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 and and who, who is the person who has the most outtakes? No, I'm joking. <laughs> It's it's very fun to get to hear the behind the scenes things that that the listeners don't get to hear because they get cut out. But uh, yeah, there's the most challenging things tend to come down to conversational flow and being in the position now that I'm not usually in where I have to speak. I can understand why it's tough to keep a coherent string of words coming out while also trying to organize your thoughts at the same time and all. Um. Mm-hmm. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have to be we have to be nice to you. You have basically compromat on all of us. So. <laughs> I was saying earlier on, it's 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 such a different position to be in when you're a host and also the editor mm-hmm. because you're constantly thinking about the edit as well as what you're saying and what other people are saying. 
So it's sort of like it pulls you in two different directions. Yeah. So you want the conversation to flow and to be interesting and to be fun. But then you are also thinking, oh, he said that he spoke for too long. I have to cut that short. You know, you're constantly <laughs> like making notes as you, as you record. I'm doing that with the things that I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I would just constantly make mental notes throughout the recording. And sometimes it would distract me too much. So then I wouldn't be able to focus on what I actually wanted to say in the podcast. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's really nice to have discreet editors and hosts now. <laughs> I just got to say, I am, I am probably the most appreciative of, of what you do. <laughs> I, I will say the challenge is like making taking something that doesn't sound as good because it you know maybe because somebody wanted to change the way they were saying something halfway through or because um, I don't know there's some audio issues like with the latest Ubuntu Summit episode stuff like that tends to just be fun mm -hmm. because of the challenge because it's you know I I have to take something that wasn't as good as it could be and kind of chop it up and make it good but also make it sound natural because. You know, I don't want necessarily the kind of jump cut YouTube video style sounding audio. I, I, uh, this may not make it into the final cut, but we'll uh, forever be grateful to Michael Tunnell for rescuing our audio <laughs> issues at, at, at the Ubuntu source. So yeah, our, our, our conference recordings are a little bit cursed, I think. <laughs> <laughs> And for, and, uh, for the listeners, thank you for being p very patient. Uh, the f the reason why it was much delayed is because of all of these audio issues. So, uh, yeah. so thanks thanks to everyone for being patient, and and uh, thanks to Jake for doing a, a massive, massively great job on editing that kind of very tricky episode to uh, to edit. Thank you. Yeah, and all the episodes really, um, because you know people might not know this but we have all we have all a tendency to ramble <laughs> really i have not noticed <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, for for the benefit of the listener there is a there is a time on the recording software and it says currently 1 hour and 19 and 20 minutes yeah It'll just get cut down to a 40 minute episode or something and, and everything should be fine. <laughs> I was going to say five. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Jake special. There um, was, there was the Jake director's cut. Executive summary. Yeah, there was one time you did release a 15 minute episode. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> 14 something minutes, yeah. I remember at the time being like, that's way too short. This will not do, sir. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, then, and then I actually listened to it and I said, oh, actually, yeah, that was pretty good. Yeah, you have to find the right balance between keeping in the stuff that's fun and enjoyable to listen to, but also not letting people ramble on too long and repeat themselves over and over and that kind of stuff. Because I don't want to remove anything important that somebody wanted to say and then couldn't get into the episode because it was just too, you know, rambling. It is a balance for, for sure. Yeah. I have nothing in comparison to either of you two guys, but I have like edited maybe about two or three of the episodes. So I've a small experience of what you guys are talking about. But yeah, it's it's it took me so long to uh, edit just a single hour ep long episode. Like it would, it would probably take me about six hours and I would, I would spread them out over two evenings. I would do three hours and then three hours. So yeah. Well, um, I think there is now AI coming to Audacity, <laughs> although on Linux you will probably have to recompile it. Uh, I, th I think I've seen it somewhere that on Linux you will have to recompile it yourself. But uh, there might be there might be an assistant uh, as soon as it start hallucinating podcasts. <laughs> A clippy like icon would just appear in, in the corner of Audacity. I see you're trying to edit a podcast episode. <laughs> in in all seriousness, though, I mean. My friend who makes music, he makes uh, techno music, he showed me a plugin that he has for mastering. Mm -hmm. So that's doing like the final, like what it says on the tin, the final master recording of your song, like the reference for your song in the highest possible like bit rate and everything. So he EQs and masters his tracks using an AI tool. So it basically just scans through the track, analyzes the waveform uh, with a really like high resolution and and basically gives you suggested mastering settings and lets you preview them. And I thought that was actually kind of great because <laughs> I was like, I could have used that shit years ago. Uh, I mean, I, I would use that in a second. So we're getting kind of, uh, we're getting on. We've been recording for well over an hour. So um, Jake, do you have any links or projects or anything like that you'd like to uh, let people know about? I guess my website, uh, I could point people to parityBit.ca. P-A-R-I-T-Y-B-I-T dot C-A. 
kind of a mixture of like a personal wiki and a blog. Uh, you might find some blog posts on there that are perhaps controversial to an audience of this podcast, but we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Great. So yeah, be sure to check that out, partybit.ca, and uh, parity bit. you not, will find... Not, not party parity. bit. People make that mistake very often. Par no, that's just my accent. Oh, okay. I said parity, but I just pronounced it like lazily. <laughs> I was... I, I, I first saw it and I read party, then bit, and then CA, I thought it was California. So, well, this guy is living the life, right? <laughs> California love. <laughs> Um, and if I, CA is not California, no. I believe that's Canada, right? Yeah, he's he's from the US of A. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, I just got it like five seconds late. <laughs> so yeah, we'll just say potato, potato, D D D, just to balance out the stereotypes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, so thanks for coming on, Jake. It was a great chat, and uh, I think a very great episode. And good luck editing this. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, as usual, you can find all our socials on uh, linuxlads.com forward slash contact. Uh, we are most active on Mastodon on our individual handles, which you'll find there, and uh, our Telegram chat as well. Uh, just because Jake mentioned his personal site, I did actually launch my own personal site not too long ago uh, called strandedoutput.com. Stranded, as in strandedoutput.com, because uh, some people hear standard uh <laughs> but that's the play on words that's it's meant to be clever and nerdy so yeah and there's not much up there at the moment but that's just my little home on the on the web for now and i will add to that as we go along so uh any closing thoughts gentlemen oh another thing to mention is that on the 3rd of february 2024 the dublin is community will be hosting a beginner friendly linux install fest so the idea is that if you're linux curious uh, brand new to linux we will have laptops there available for demonstration purposes uh, also you're encouraged to bring your own laptop if you want we can install linux on that computer just come along hang out with us and ask questions it should be a good time so that is the 3rd of february 2024 in the t cube co-working space in dublin and i would encourage you to come along so that about wraps it up for this week. Uh, sorry, this one was a bit delayed. Uh, we did have some scheduling conflicts over the Christmas, so uh, we'll be back to our sort of usual cadence uh, pretty soon. Um, and uh, as always, thanks for listening and see you in approximately two weeks. Goodbye. Ciao. Bye. Bye. No, no, totally cut all this out. This is all background <laughs> yeah, information. No, <laughs>